In this learning objective, we understand the small firm effect, considering it as a potential example of growth investing, and just also discuss some of the limitations of the application of this particular approach. So one of the most widely used passive growth strategies is the idea of investing in small cap companies. The idea here is that you might have small, immature firms that have greater growth prospects. And while there's substantial empirical evidence that supports this strategy, there is actually some debate whether or not these additional returns may simply be just a compensation for risk, and also the question of whether these uh, returns that we see when we do statistical analysis of the small firm effect can actually be exploited in terms of a real-world investment strategy. So let's first begin by looking at what the research evidence shows us about this small firm effect. So there's a vast body of research that shows that if we look over a long time period, small firms tend to earn a higher return compared with large firms. On the screen here we can see decile portfolios based on the market capitalization of firms and these portfolios are rebalanced every, uh, every year, annually rebalanced. What we can see in this particular slide is that the smallest decile of stocks across the period 1926 to 2008 earned an average annual return of 19.34%, whereas that average annual return decreases all the way down, the largest stocks earned an average annual return of 10.77%. So this difference between the average returns of the small and largest section of our universe of stocks is what we call the small firm effect. Now there are a couple of interesting phenomena to identify when we're looking at this smaller firm effect. Most particularly if we're looking at the premium, we can see it's really driven by the extreme performance of that very small decile of stocks. Okay, that very small decile of stocks earns a return of 19.34%, and that drops off quite a lot. So even though we see this continually decreasing return as the deciles get larger, none of the drop-offs are quite as big as this first one. So a key question around the, whether this strategy is exploitable or not is a question of whether we can actually feasibly invest in this smallest decile of stocks. This is the evidence from the United States. What happens when we look at Australia? Well, in the Australian market, studies have looked at the same issue. And here we have our size-based portfolios across the period 1975 to 2006. Quintile portfolios are five portfolios. And once again, we see this same phenomena. Average monthly returns of the smallest quintile of stocks are very high and decrease substantially for other quintiles. In Australia, we see the same phenomena as the US. That is, the size effect really appears to be driven by the smallest segment of the market. Now, while long time periods have demonstrated that investing in small firms does appear to be an effective trading strategy, there is some suggestion that this strategy has not been effective in recent periods. So a range of academic studies have actually identified that the size effect has disappeared in recent decades. Uh, Jeremy Siegel in his book notes that the size effect and its outperformance is really largely driven by the outperformance of small firms back in the 1960s and 1970s. So with this in mind, let's break down the size effect across decades and let's have a look at what the results actually show us. So what we can see here is these are the average uh, returns on a size premium. By size premium, I mean the return differential between the smallest decile and largest decile of stocks. And this analysis is using the US uh, market data. We have the average monthly return premium for those two portfolios, where the dark green bars represent the return difference between small and large cap stocks being statistically significant. We can see the 1930s and 1940s, quite a large size effect that didn't tend to exist in the 1950s. But again, there was a large size effect in the 60s and 70s, and this is Siegel's point from his book. And where studies start to talk about the disappearing size effect was the beginning of the 1980s, because we can see in the 1980s and 1990s, the size premium was negative. This implies that large firms actually earned a higher return than small firms. However, of note, we can look at the performance of small firms in the 2000s, and we can actually see that there appears to have been a return of the effectiveness of the small firm investment strategy, because across this particular decade, small firms outperform large firms by an average of 1% per month. So, while people have argued that size effect has disappeared, and hence this is no longer an effective trading strategy, this most recent decade may give us some evidence to suggest that there may be basis for considering investing in small firms going forward. So if we are considering an investment in small firms or 
trying to exploit the size effect. We have to identify uh, what the explanation might be for this phenomena and hence identify what investment philosophy it might align with. Well, there's a whole lot of evidence that suggests that the size effect may be just a compensation for risk. Uh, but in this case, we're talking about maybe dimensions of risk outside systematic risk of, of beta that's measured in the CAPM. So Vassal and Zing look at this argument uh, and they identify that small firms have higher exposure to default risk and that may be potentially what's driving this small firm effect. Uh, similarly, there's been a whole raft of studies that have shown that uh, the size premium or the SMB factor, SMB is just an abbreviation for small minus big, that it tends to vary uh, pro-cyclically with the business cycle. That is, small firms tend to do well when the economy is doing reasonably well and tend to do poorly when the economy is not doing so well. And that pro-cyclical variation with the business cycle uh, is indicative of the fact that this may be some uh, compensation for some sort of economic risk. However, there's a range of other explanations for the size effect that are uh, related to market frictions. A common argument is associated with liquidity. As we expect, small firms are less liquid. We know that there is a bigger bid-ask spread and bigger price impact for, for small firms. Hence, potentially what we, we may see is that the small firm effect is a compensation for a liquidity risk premium. Uh, a range of studies have looked at this issue and you know, identified the fact that small firms are obviously less liquid and seek to explain the size effect in terms of illiquidity and, and, and argue that this may be the driving force. Another potential explanation for the size effect is information asymmetries because another issue we find in the small uh, in the universe of small stocks is that there tends to be a lot less information available for these stocks. So what we plotted here is for the US market the percentage of stocks uh, that are covered by analysts and the average number of analysts covering each stocks. What we can see is that the majority of large caps and quite a large number of mid caps are covered by at least one analyst in the US market. Whereas for micro caps, only about 20% of them are covered by at least one analyst. And the average number of analysts covering each stock is, is well below one, uh, compared to about 23 for large cap stocks. So given there's less research, less analysts covering these stocks, it may be uh, expected that there's less information available and such information asymmetry creates a risk and hence maybe investors demand a higher return for investing in those micro caps. There's a few other potential explanations uh, for the size effect and uh, there's a bunch of studies that identify that the size premium is really just driven by uh, excess returns in the month of January and that there is no size effect in months thereafter. So potentially size is just some remnant of calendar year phenomena. So if we look at returns uh, of the size effect in January versus non-January months, what we've plotted here is once again the decile portfolios, smallest through to largest. But in this particular case, we're looking at the average monthly returns for January months in blue and the average monthly returns for non-January months in red. So we see a really stark size effect in the month of January, huge positive returns for the smallest decile of stocks and big decrease as we move toward the largest decile of stocks. But the difference in returns, or the returns across all those different portfolios, is flat in non-January months, in the other 11 months of the year. That is, there's no size effect between February and December. So potentially some of the arguments that we see for the January effect generally, issues like tax loss selling and window dressing, potentially they're explaining this size effect. So it's debatable whether or not the size effect actually exists. And uh, uh, another question that we have to move to if we are going to use this uh, and execute the size effect as an investment strategy is a question of can it be something that uh, is economically feasible to exploit? So when we're identifying whether or not we can invest in small cap stocks, the first question is to identify, well, what stocks comprise the, the universe of small stocks in Australia? So there's a range of different ways we can think about this. We looked earlier at uh, our decile splits in terms of the academic studies, and maybe we could think of uh, investing in deciles. Well, if we think about that in Australia, the smallest decile of stocks in Australia has a median market capitalization of around $2 million. Okay, that's the whole firm's market value is only $2 million, which is basically the price of a house in Sydney. These firms are so small and so illiquid that it is just not feasible for any reasonably sized place uh, any reasonably sized trade to be placed in order to buy or sell these stocks. So it's pretty apparent that we can't buy the smallest decile stocks in Australia. 
So maybe we think about other academic studies, such as Farmer French, which split the universe at the median in half and identify the, the uh, stocks below the median as being small cap. Well, if we do this and we look at the median market cap in Australia, that median market capitalization is still around $20 million. So we're still talking about really small stocks that uh, we can't feasibly invest in. So even the middle stock in terms of market capitalization in Australia is too small for an institutional investor to go about buying. So we can't really even uh, feasibly exploit the size effect in terms of the bottom half of stocks by size in the Australian market. So can we go about exploiting it? Well, there's research that suggests that the, uh, the statistical returns generated by the size effect in Australia is really subsumed by transaction costs because of the fact that these, these particular companies are so small. Now what we know is there are some funds that do attempt to exploit the size effect. And what these funds do is that they look at the smallest companies that are listed uh, on the ASX 300 index. So they might look, for example, at uh, defining the top 100 stocks as being large and between stock number 101 and 300 as being small cap, uh, and then between 300 and 500 being micro cap stocks, uh, as an example. So the question is if we're going to define our uh, small stocks in such a way, the question is, is there a size effect in terms of a return differential between the largest 100 stocks and say the next 200 stocks, numbers 101 to, to 300? So if this was our definition of small firms, is there an exploitable size effect? What I've done here is I've looked at the returns of the uh, ASX 100 index versus the small ordinaries index. And if we look at these returns across time, we can see that they, they follow each other quite closely. And the return difference across time, on average, is basically zero. So the return difference is 0.77% per annum, which is not statistically different from zero. Basically, this is telling us that if we define small firms in this way, if we're using this definition that the top 100 firms are large caps and numbers 101 to 300 are small caps, with a view to the fact that in Australia, potentially only the, the 300 largest stocks comprise our feasible set of investments, well, if we're defining our small cap in that way, there's actually no small firm premium, so it doesn't appear to be something that can be exploited. So in net, while there's pretty strong academic evidence and statistical evidence that shows that before incorporating transaction costs, there is a size effect, this is something that is very difficult and potentially even impossible to exploit as an effective trading strategy.